Welcome back, TV. Welcome back, everybody. Oh, I switched from Dutch to English in like uh, too quickly. Uh, but welcome back. Uh, we're going to have like a panel discussion now, like on starting a game studio and uh, how, how what things that pops up when you're doing that and how to make it successful. Uh, and there are like three really experienced uh, uh, game developers uh, in this panel. Uh, Leonard Sass, Thomas Sala and Matthijs van der Laar. All three Dutch studios that actually have their own successes in their own way uh, and their own experiences, of course. And they're going to discuss those topics in the upcoming panel. So may I have a big clapperty clap on the chat for Thomas Sala, Leonard Sass and Matthijs van der Laar. TV. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, Leon already introduced us a little bit, but um, I'm going to be uh, sort of hosting this panel and, uh, and opposing sort of the, the, the questions and the topics that we can discuss. Um, I guess to start off, just a, a small introduction of what we exactly do in, in the in the companies that we work at or that we founded in this case. Um, yeah, Leonard, if you could maybe start with a little uh, introduction of yourself. Sure. Hey, hello. I'm uh, Leonard, one, one of the two founders of Triumph Studios. We started over in uh, 1997, so it's ages ago. Um, so we started Triumph um, to make strategy games. Age of Wonders were, was the first series we made. Uh, and then we did a game called Overlords, an action adventure. And um, so we went from sort of independent to third party developer. And now we, we then went back to being independent for Age of Wonders 3. And now we are uh, part of Paradox Interactive, big Swedish publisher. Yeah, cool. Thomas is also with us, Thomas Sala. Um, hello. <laughs> Um, yeah, oh, I a uh, little introduction. I started out in 2001, uh, was co founder for a company called Little Chicken Game Company. I uh, did a lot of work for hire, educational, advertising stuff, weird stuff. Um, eventually, I said that my light is not good and that my light um, is not good. Uh, that it's stuff, and then, uh, sorry, I'm getting multiple sounds there. Uh, uh, and at some point, uh, I realized I didn't, <laughs> I didn't enjoy working in a, 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 a group uh, setting anymore. So now I'm a solo developer. I just released my first solo developed title called Falconeer on uh, Xbox Series X and S and PC. Yeah, awesome. Uh, yeah, and I'm Matthijs van der Laar. I'm a creative director at Trollbound. We're a, a slightly younger studio. We were founded in 2013, and our biggest title, um, basically our only title, I guess, uh, was launched last year, which is called Pine. Um, that's our uh, our only claim to fame at this point. So it's really interesting, I think, in this panel is the, the variety of people that we have present, right? Um, we have, on the one hand, we have people with a lot of experience and a lot of experience even uh, dating all the way back to before the, the 2000s. Um, and we have someone who has a lot of experience, but then switched to a completely new experience and basically had to had to restart everything he uh, he knew. Um, so there's some really interesting topics there, I think. And to start off, let's just go chronologically and start at the beginning, uh, which in this case is Leonard, I suppose, uh, 1997, right? Starting a studio. How did that go? Like, wh what was the situation back then? And was it easy at that point? Oh, sorry, you're muted, I think. Right? Yeah. The <laughs> it's a habit. Uh, the um, I think the situation is, is quite similar to a lot of uh, other indies that start these days. Um, so just a bunch of kids, you, you meet at school, big dreams, you know, creating your own studio, uh, working on, uh, you know, like uh, pizza and, uh, and handouts from your parents or the government, and uh, uh, you don't really know what you're getting into. I think the uh, the big difference is that back then there was no digital distribution. So basically you, all, you had to aim big you, you, you had to go into retail especially in international retail so you wanted to have a publishing deal uh, so we really set out to make a uh, yeah, a large game that compete with uh with commercial titles um, so it took us uh, a very long time also lots of support uh, 
So we hooked up with, with a publisher uh, back in the day, first with Epic Games, and then we got um, uh, picked up by a publisher called uh, Gathering of Developers, which uh, turned into Take-Two, or uh, got acquired by Take-Two Interactive. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's been the start for us. That's pretty interesting, actually, how similar that is. I expected a very different story because this is pretty similar to how we started, for example, you know, as a student company and living off noodles and pizzas and, uh, yeah, just trying to get something off the ground. But I do think, like you said, we didn't have to aim as big, right? You can you can do this with a smaller game and a smaller project at this point. Um, so, Thomas, uh, Little Chicken started about 18 years ago, I think. Um, was it similar for you? Uh, and your brother, I believe, is, is the other co-founder? brother and Janos and Senna. Uh, yeah, I did the same back then. There was no distribution either. And I think we were very much clueless because uh, there was also no uh, schools or anything uh, teaching anything. And mm. if, if you weren't, I, I, we weren't part of a demo scene or, and we had zero knowledge. So we were just saying, we want to make games. <laughs> How do you do that? How do you get to make a living? And uh, I think we, we just had to, okay, then someone needs to pay you to make games. Uh, and uh, uh, one of us was more commercial than the others. Well, let's go talk to people who need games for advertising or games on the web or, and we just, did that uh, initially on noodles and pizza, I think, for years and years and years before <laughs> you, we started to make uh, any sense of money. And that turned into a fairly successful uh, work for hire business that was just very uh, diverse in what it did. So, uh, okay. Uh, just strange, weird projects for whoever <laughs> paid us. So, Which you always a- started with client projects already? Well, we we made our first. We started with making our own first games for the web. Some of which went really successful on back then when web 3D games were a thing, like mm. 2001, 2002, uh, and there were sites that were pilfering games. So there's we had games out there that been played for millions uh, of sessions or whatever users, but we never saw a cent because they just put it on their site and had, right. they took the ads. And we thought we didn't know. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, 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 did, we did that for a bit, and we tried. We had some contacts, but it's uh, uh, the, what happens. And I think that's a very recognized when you get into service, or someone at some point starts paying you. you go, wow, that's real money. Mm. You can make something for real money, uh, and that snowballs into a point where you have actual solid revenue. Uh, right. That's the difference from a service side, and that's very attractive in its own way. And then you can hire people. And then uh, you can try to find your creativity on that and be diverse and serviceable and all that. Uh, for me, that had a, how do you call it, an expiration date. But uh, uh, certainly the, that company still exists going strong. Yeah. So, uh, Yeah, for sure. I think that's that's an interesting uh, like fork and road already um, between you know what Triumph did uh, back in the day and what you did. You said you had someone business-minded in the team, so you went for you know client projects and... Uh, going for people who needed games, but I guess Leonard, in, in your case, you went for, you know, your own creative endeavor and and wanting to make something of your own and trying to sell that in the end, right? Like after a longer process. So, why did you why did you decide to go for that? It's 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 a bigger risk, I guess, in that sense. Mm, yeah, we back then we didn't really think much in, in terms of risks. I mean, you're young, so you have uh, uh, not a lot to lose. And I think that uh, you know, like uh, if you see people in the that, that want starting the games the business. Um, they do so, uh, you know, from different positions. And if you're if you're a student, if you're just getting started, you're willing to take on a lot of risk. Uh, maybe if you've got a family, uh, less so. Um, uh, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah, I think I yeah I, I totally feel what you mean. That's exactly what our our company was also based on is is the idea of you know now is the time to do this right now we have that opportunity but it's interesting because we had the choice between going for for client projects and, and entertainment with a lot of experience behind us that we could look at right you know we could see the two paths and how we would embark on any of them but it feels like both of you back in the day didn't really have that reference right that that much reference at least we certainly didn't have any reference i think yeah. we desperately wanted to do what leonard did but we had i think we had negative experience you know we just didn't know anything so we had no clue where to start that's crazy yeah <laughs> same yeah, for you it, leonard i guess well what really helped us is um we, we got into contact at one point with uh arjen brisset who's one of the founders of uh of guerrilla games mm. and 
he knew uh, folks at Epic Games. So at one point we were still uh, in school and uh, we managed to get an internship at, at Epic uh, on the pretext of finishing our uh, our game uh, in, in the view for mm. them. So in those uh, months that we stayed there, uh, we learned a lot. We met like uh, Tim Sweeney and Cliffy B and all those, uh, all those folks and we hang out with them. And the, that was even before we started officially as a company in the... Uh, I think it was 1994 that we wow. went there for the first time. Yeah, and was it already Age of Wonders, or at least you know the the base of the first game? A, you were gonna a predecessor. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, uh, once we uh, graduated, we decided to finish our uh, our, our bachelors, and um, when we were uh, ready, we we said, okay, our game is now outdated. Uh, we need to uh, restart from scratch, do everything proper, and that's when uh, Triumph really started. And, um... Awesome, yeah. Okay, so in both cases, I think also the one of the main topics that we always talk about in a lot of these um, in these panels and in any conference is that financing is, is pretty much always the hardest battle that that independent devel developers or small developers have to uh, have to battle, right? Um, so in these first stages, what were your main sources of financing, or what was the business model like? What what did you once you got things rolling? Um, I can imagine that for for Thomas, for example, the revenue was going to come in a bit more quickly because it were those were smaller projects, right? Or am I completely off here? Yeah, well, the, of course those are smaller. So those, I think, the average turnaround was four months, three months, right? Uh, or even faster at some point when we were doing advertising games for Heineken and, and stuff. They always wanted everything in six weeks done, <laughs> uh, and then it would exist for six weeks and then be gone forever. I kind of enjoyed that because you know I'm I'm so, sort of hectic, so I, I yeah the new challenge yeah a new a new thing a new thing. <laughs> so uh, I think the main challenge there is if if you do go for work for hire, I think lots of free, freelancers is that there are periods where uh, you you don't have any work, and if you've got people on the payroll, that's just money losing right there, and it, you're only getting literally paid for the hours that you work. So if you don't work, you're you're basically at a loss. Um, whereas if you have uh, a game you sell, you can, you know, uh, you hopefully get revenue over the long term. So you have passive income or whatever you want to call it. If you're doing work for IRE, you have none of that. So you might have money on the bank for a couple of months. After that, it's gone. So if you if you spend, if you have eight weeks without a client, you're basically bankrupt. Uh, 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 and that is that is that is its own version of hell in a, in yeah a way. that's harsh <laughs> so yeah. that's uh, that that i think that's the core model is like a freelancer you're always looking up for the next client you right. always want to align up a couple of clients and you feel very unsafe if you don't have a job after your job mm. uh, so that's that's that but then in a bigger scale because at some point uh, when you do work for hire people demand a certain level of service they you know call they you want they you know they want uh, someone who can help them. They want to be serviced when there's a problem, when the servers crash. Uh, so you, you need people on board. You need to be able to develop quickly. Then there's, you know, then there's the problem. Uh, you've got two clients. You don't want to say no. The other, both clients are saying, we need this at that time. So mm. okay, then you have to have two teams, and then the risk doubles because you need to have two clients. You need to have four clients in the wings for those two teams, and those rarely overlap and all that stuff. So that's the 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 jigsaw for work for hire is always just making sure that it's covered for everybody. That's uh, crazy, yeah. And that's such a different approach, I think, to the yeah the entertainment business, at least as I know it, um, only for recent years. But Leonard has known for for many years, I I, I guess, uh, because for us the risk is is very much throughout the project. You know, we we have to. What we did is is we had a very stepping stone approach. Um, you know, we, we had all the options in the world at this point uh, in time. We had crowdfunding, which I guess didn't exist back in your day. Um, we had uh, publishers as options. Um, we could also, you know, employ uh, the school period that we had um, very officially as a graduation thing. So there were all these, these small parts of it um, that in the end made up the budget for a four-year project, which is very different from a four-month project. But I guess, Leonard, for you, um, how did you, did you find that first investment in Epic Games, or was that a different partner that you went with in the end? Um, yeah, there was very little uh, direct investment. The Triumph was a startup company, 
but it meant that at the moment that we released our game, we, we, we suddenly uh, got a pile of money, uh, yeah. right? Because we really, we didn't have to pay back any investors. Um, That's crazy, yeah. So uh, we were down in a good spot and said like, uh, yeah, let's make another game. Uh, so we, we, uh, um, just we, 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 we managed to, to keep a good um, cash uh, on the bank and some, some royalties. And then we, we got an immediate sequel deal uh, with, with a publisher. So we rolled it to a sequel. And that way we always had like this war chest. And wow. um, building on the recurring revenue uh, is key, I think, for any business. Um, so you do that through royalties, but also having an IP, uh, which you can build on at sequels or made expansions, yeah. uh, build technology that you can share between projects. <laughs> and that's how you create value in your company and how you can grow. Um, right. So yeah, recurring revenue has always been very quickly at the top of our heads. Yeah, that's smart. I think um, the yeah the scary part for for having a studio right now and not having that luxury of, you know, for example, we had half a million was invested in us by a publisher, and that first needed to be recouped before we would see any money. Um, so you you try to mitigate this in the budget plans and stuff, but. If the game just doesn't sell well, that was it, right? For us, that was a risk we were willing to take. We just wanted to get this product out and, and see what was going to happen, right? None of us had bought houses or uh, had kids or even a dog, right? So this was a, an easy situation to be in. Um, but I think many, many indie studios just don't get past their, their first game and they don't even have the luxury of choosing. So, yeah, that's that's a pretty brilliant start, I would say. If uh, if anyone would you know, have that opportunity right now, they would take it, I, uh, I guess. So you mentioned sequels, and I think that's a really, really interesting one, because at some point, you know, especially for companies that have many games, uh, many titles, for you, Leonard, you switch from Age of Wonders to Overlord, which is quite a, a different genre, right? So at what point did you think it's it's really time for something new? We're not going to do any any more sequels or step out of this this IP. Uh, yeah, we we made like two and a half uh, Age of Wonders games at one point. Mm. We said like, okay, let's try something new and. Uh, that that point, the uh, the games industry was also changing. So we had uh, a period where boxed PC games were dying, but uh, you know Steam really hadn't appeared on the stage yet. Uh, but back then, like every console, every publisher was spoke that like uh, console was uh, is where it need to be. So we started uh, thinking about okay, how can we you know make uh, a a strategy game or something from our own experience on console. So Overlord actually started off as a um, as us trying to make a strategy game on console, and it sort of <laughs> gravitated from some from from an uncontrollable uh, uh, strategy game with a controller into a sort of an action adventure role playing right. game. Cool. Uh, and yeah, we burned a lot through a lot of cash uh, making that transition. Uh, it also learned us like making these transitions not easy, and you enter a new arena where. A lot of the expertise that you had uh, in the past, you lose. Uh, yeah. So the, the switching costs are enormous, and um, yeah, that's. Uh, but it was a lot of fun. It was a lot. Yeah. Of, it was a good, you know, it really uh, revitalized uh, our, our creativity, and uh, we had lots of fun making it. Yeah. Well, talking about transitions that aren't easy, <laughs> Mr. Sala, uh, <laughs> you did quite the transition on on every possible level. You. You decided to to break out of uh, the client work and the, the work for hire and do something completely of your own, right? So what what made the made you make the final decision? Like when when was the moment you thought this is this is it? Uh, well, the, like I said, uh, the the, uh, the work for hire life, and then we did try to get it into. We did a a, a, a VR project for Sony first party and stuff like that. Uh, it was all. Um, at at some point, to be honest, at some point I just burned out really badly. Mm. I couldn't work for quite a while, uh, and I had to do some soul sourcing, uh, go visit some therapists, and uh, uh, at some point uh, my therapist said, well, "I've got this test to see if you if you've got ADD." Uh, uh, I don't think you need to do the test because I kind of know. But uh, <laughs> and uh, that was one of the first things. That entire process of sort of refiguring out. So I realized I. I had been struggling with because your studio at some point it was you know, from 15 people you can manage it by yourself you know it's like five people working on a game or eight or ten you, you can shout loud or just say you know you're, okay you go home i'll do it or there's all kinds of ways where you can manage it without being a manager 
Uh, but there's a point where you can't do that anymore. And it's uh, you have to be uh, someone who is, uh, how do you call it, organized and uh, right. uh, interested in how people are doing and stuff. Not that I'm a brutish person, but <laughs> I, I just want to make stuff. You're not a manager type. I, I am yeah. not interested in your scrum meeting or your list or your to-do list or your yeah. fucking planning. Uh, all that <laughs> stuff, I, 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 you know, I suck at it. I'm not interested in it. And I, I'm not interested in doing meetings. So people would hate having meetings with me. We'd do meetings and it'd go in. I'd just have a, 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 I'd, I'd prepared a bullet list just five minutes. With, this is what we're going to do today and the next couple of days. Okay, everybody ready? <laughs> Let's get to work. Yeah, let's uh, be do like it, yeah. five or six or ten people look at it. yeah but this is also work explaining to us what we need to do uh, yeah but it's not really work is it uh <laughs> uh this, uh, yeah. this, uh I'd, 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 I'd be you know I'd, 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 i just wanted to exit the room and stuff like that I'd, later on i learned that <laughs> that's just uh, the way i am mm. uh and that and, you know it took me a long time to figure out that uh, there wasn't a management course or a leadership trainee or uh, you know, some magic, well, they're, they're, you could have, you know, uh, uh, add some pills in there. Yeah. Uh, but there wasn't much that's going to take my chaotic ass and make it into a fantastic team player. Um, I think it's awesome that you have that opportunity now in, in you know, in this time, in, in this day and age, because a one-man team, you know, one person making a complete game that's from the very old days, but at the, the graphical fidelity that you're doing in that, that's not... A very common I'd say thing, there's but... a revival going on because there's more more mm. more solo developers. Uh, there's the guy from Dark, and uh, there's there's more people sort of slowly rediscovering. There's a lot of fun there, a lot of things, and uh, yeah, for me, it's it's actually what I've always been do doing and enjoyed doing. I'm always the guy, you know, there at twelve at night just coding or you know saying, yeah, okay, you guys something. go home, and in the morning, look at what I made. You know, I'm that yeah. guy, uh, uh, and I've always I've been I'm a three D art press trade, but I've always uh, done bits of programming, and at some point, I'd, I think it was a, a perfect storm. So I had that personal process. Then there was mm -hmm. a person, a, a point, that said, "Well, I, I think I've got all the skills. You know, I've looked at all the programmers. I've looked at the <laughs> structure, the stuff, and how to do it. I've done a console title. Uh, I sort of think I know what I'm doing now. I think I can. Uh, yeah. And then there was the opportunity uh, with Microsoft, and then." Uh, yeah, then the stars align and you just, you got to jump. That's the thing. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. I think it, it's awesome that you took the jump because the game is obviously, it's, a, it's an amazing project. And I'm, I'm glad that people caught on that you're a, a one-man project as well because um, what we've seen with, with Pine, um, when, you're, when you're operating in 3D and it looks kind of, you know, professional, I guess, in a way, uh, sometimes it's really hard to, to not drown in, in the, the much, much bigger studios and bigger titles. Um, and I'm glad that people got on that the Falconeer is, uh, you know, a, a one-man wonder, I guess, in that sense. So size-wise, I mean, we just talked about it briefly before, but Triumph is, is one of getting one of the bigger ones in, in the Netherlands. So how did that process go? Is it is it very organic or at some point where you like, we now need 10 more people and we're just going to hire them and that that's how we're going to, you know, build our studio? Uh, well, not, we, we, we are sort of like medium sized I, I would say like yeah, five, yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. 40 uh, people at the office um yeah uh, you know we, we make titles across multiple platforms that that compete with you know like large strategy titles from other game uh, uh large larger publishers so there's a certain minimum but barrier to entry there and mm. um you know you, you have certain uh, features and production values to uh to, to 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 account for, I think that's where uh, you, you you stop being indie and you start uh, having employees, and like uh, you just need them. You mean right? Yeah, you you start rolling into that process, which uh, Thomas just described so well, with lots of meetings. And at one point, you you discover that you're you're not actually you know doing much development work in yourself anymore, not direct. Mm -hmm. I mean, in my case, I'm still uh, involved in design and, and direction, but. Uh, not in uh, programming art uh, or writing too complex design documents because if I'm off the grid for like like a week in order to uh, to work on something uh, take a deep dive on a particular topic, then yeah, the certain processes just stop and uh, yeah, and that that's very frustrating. Uh, yeah, I, I I I totally feel that I have the same. I'm at that point where I need to decide if I go more into the business direction or more into the design direction. 
um, meaning I won't be making as many puzzles and writing dialogues and the, the stuff I really enjoy, or you get somebody to do that in the team. So have you always been doing this from the inside, if that makes sense? Um, as in, have you ever hired an external producer or somebody external to, to deal with the CEO kind of tasks and the managing, or was it always somebody who was also there with the founding of the company? Um, no, for most of the company, I've done all the business uh, side. So when we were uh, independent, of course, with my uh, co-founder Arno. Um, but when it comes to uh, like the, the, the contract stuff and uh, whatnot, uh, I did a fair bit of that. But yeah, when you make like a, a large game of three years, uh, it, it goes in phases, right? So there's particular sides when suddenly the business side of things is, is very important, and then you know, so the focus, uh, you know, throughout a project's uh, life uh, changes for me, and uh, that's mm. also what keeps it very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, but no, we do cool. have a very uh, you know, good management team at, at the studio. We have multiple managers in each discipline. We have uh, a very cool uh, operations manager, Ronald, who, who does a lot of the um, yeah, HR stuff, for example, and, uh, oh, that's good, and, yeah. and helps with like, stuff like forecasts and whatnot. Um, yeah. So I still get to be involved in decisions, but I don't need to do all the, all the, yeah, the, the day-to-day work on, on that. So that, that really helps. Yeah. Yeah, and for Thomas, I guess it's completely different because he has to do everything himself, right? Uh, or do you actually have people and partners that you work with for uh, uh, financing business, all that stuff? Um, not for, yeah, I have an accountant, but that's, uh, that's <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, um, I think up until I had a, I got my audio musician, composer, audio guy, Benedict Nichols, like last year. Um, and uh, the the publishers who's important, so he, he they handle quite a lot. Uh, so I, I would say it's more like a solo album, you know. Honest. So I'm making the entire game, but I don't have to worry about porting it. I don't, there's QA people testing it, feedbacking me on my Skype. Hey, dude, this mission is borked or whatever or not. Uh, there's people checking <laughs> my English. So there's people supporting, so that I can just wake up and uh, what am I going to do today? Uh, flying eels, excellent. Uh, <laughs> but those are so people from the publisher, or uh, yeah, from the publisher company? mostly, yeah. Yeah, well, that's interesting. Then the publisher becomes sort of an extension of your team, but only for this project, and they probably finance you as well. I guess that's your uh, not much. Well, I think one of the the things I did is is when when I left Little Chickens, uh, you know, I had no uh, war chest or anything, so I, it's just mm. I. Uh, the I was able to procure a deal and a publisher, but it's just one guy, so yeah. the, for them it's like uh, peanut money. Yeah, so, that's not uh, much. Uh, a single deal would be pay me for two years, and yeah. it has. So uh, yeah, that's but, awesome. So I got without going deep, there's not been a lot of money spent. So uh, that left space for voice acting and other stuff, of course. On the whole, uh, that is the calculated risk. Is to say, well, you can make a game by yourself. Can you make something that is going to compete with Valhalla or even, you know, uh, Age of Wonders? Possibly not. You know, let's be <laughs> realistic there. Um, would it need to be? No, because it needs to feed, you know, myself and the people at the publisher to right. be profitable. So it's 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 a different ball game. So that's uh, yeah. that makes it a more uh, a safer, uh, how do you call it, a, a, a less dangerous journey. That said. You know, now that the game is out and, uh, the, and I can say, well, it's uh, successful enough to go, yeah. Uh, 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 and someone said to me yesterday, but it also couldn't have, you know. You could have sat yeah. here and been a big fat flop and not a launch title and, you know, have 500 sales uh, and, and you'd be broke and, and out of a company. And yeah. uh, that is the risk. And I would, oh, I, I, I never assumed that was going to happen, but it could very well have happened. Uh, so that is that is the, the 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 dark realization of that. But uh, yeah, so this, you know, if you do things by yourself, you're super agile and, uh, and mm. not not the programming method, is, but just 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 quick on your feet. You don't cost much. It is an interesting proposition. It's all also how do you call it? It's also a, a how do you call it? a liability because I could drop off, have another burnout. It's always danger. Uh, yeah, it's not easy. Like, not everyone can work on their own, right? Um, do everything and, and context switch between art and programming, like you do. I think uh, that's yeah. That's and I think for the for the publisher, it, it it was a, a risk, you know, a calculated risk. Because uh, uh, 
but it, in the end, it's a risk. It costs resources to support the game, promote sure, the game, yeah. get you know your entire PR team. Uh, so the, and then you know, is this guy by himself in his in, in his uh, you know, I didn't have this. This is uh, the old bedroom uh, mm. guy in the, in his living room making game. Ever going to finish this game? Yes. Yeah. A lot of people don't ever finish the game. I think that's a huge uh, uh, pitfall. Uh, so in that sense, it was it was risky in different ways. And then there, you know, there's also where people go, well, this is a game I make by one guy. It's probably shit, or it's probably not big, or it's probably not ambitious. So there's that vibe as well. So there's downsides and upsides. Yeah, yeah. For us, it was always the risk. As long as the risk is with other people as well, like the publisher in this case, right? If the publisher is financing us and they believe in us, um, even if the game doesn't go right, we make sure that we don't like personally um, get hit by this right at the end. Um, so Leonard, in in Triumph's case, you're you're famously acquired at some point by Paradox, right? And like a very large company. Does that mean? for you, you you sleep better at night like does it feel like the risk is somewhere else or um at least that you always have a, a sort of a, a bit of safety extra that maybe some indie devs don't have or how does that work uh i mean yeah, I, don't, I don't think that that was the primary reason that we sold the company um mm. but yeah yeah you never know what happens i mean we've we've been independent for 20 years uh, and there, there have been uh, like very lots of times of really good times. But there has also been like some difficult times, but yeah, it really helps with being part of a of a large company. And uh, you know, it's, I think it's also great for the team that they um, have a, like a much broader horizon. You know, part of a company of six hundred and fifty people, I believe, like last time I I heard. And um, you know, having all that interchange with different departments from. Uh, you know, Air Herbert Screen in, in Seattle, or people from the PDS in Stockholm, knowledge sharing, um, getting intel on the market. Uh, in the past, we really felt that we were working blindly. Um, right. So it is, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a fantastic uh, being, being part of Paradox. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And, and do you think, um, was this always the goal from the start um, to at some point sell the company or was it just something that came on, on to your paths or was this something you've been talking about for years before it happened or um, like, was it a strategy, I guess, in a way? Not really. I mean, uh, we, we had had a couple of talks when it came to acquisition and never really materialized until we uh, uh, met uh, Fred, who's the former CEO at uh, from Paradox at a party. And, uh, just mm. casually like, oh, you know, why don't we buy That's where the best things happen, right? And, uh, <laughs> here we are. Um, so, yeah, it was just a, a good match. Uh, the right yeah, partners. Cool. Yeah. I see we have only a few minutes left. This is uh, the time is flying. I, I very um, bravely said that, yes, we take questions in the chat, but I completely forgot to check them. One of them is, how important are trendy game mechanics for sales? And if not, what kind of quality game mechanics do you think are important? I guess that's a bit of a broad question, but do we do we see um, like the, the the next game that we're gonna make? Uh, do you guys look at um, what's hot and like what's trendy in, in terms of mechanics or or maybe art styles or something, or are you building on something deeper than that? I think at the moment that you discover something is trendy, uh, by the time <laughs> you finish a game three years later, it's, it's kind yeah. of a bit trendy. That's a good point, yeah. <laughs> uh, but of course, we do take a look at, at, at competition, especially I think when it comes to, uh, you know, like interface conventions or uh, when you take a look at, uh, right. you know, like how, how markets are developing, how genres are developing. Sure. But I think that, um, you know, yeah, that like the, the whole genre of today might be... Um, yeah, you know, goal in, in three years time. Yeah, but for Falconeer, I think it's quite well known that you just made something you really wanted to make, Thomas. Right? So, yeah. how does that process work? If you if you start expanding this to sustaining your game studio, like, do you can you do that again? You think? I, I, well, I I don't think I can make a game like Falconeer again because it's part of an mm. art project. It's part of uh, you know uh, personal expression. Uh, and it's you know the genre is that uh, the genre of you know like 90s air combat games because those were the games i you know enjoyed when i grew up and was you know uh, getting into games so it's that fit that personal narrative it would never be that on any other genre uh, the fact that that hadn't been around for a long time was sort of interesting to me so i do i did have a think you know uh, play to your strengths uh, and not to your weaknesses 
Uh, but in the end, you know, for me, it's you got to make what you got to make. And uh, uh, hmm. I don't want to be, you know, uh, I want it to be different. You know, I think that's, uh, I want it to be original rather than not original. I think that's the the thing I pride myself most on. It. There's, there's not been a review that's not said it's highly original. Uh, so that's, that's, that's. Uh, I enjoyed that part of it, be original. And I do think that that might not be the ideal path to commercial giant success, but mm. it will get you noticed in ways. Uh, if you make something of quality that is original, that's a much better proposition than you're making something of quality that's trendy. Fuck that. Yeah, I think I think you can really see that in the Falconeer as well. I think that's part of its, its big appeal is that you see that it's somebody's passion and has been. Um, essential as a indie title yeah. that, that you have something novel to show yeah i think so too yeah that, that's quite different from the from the super large titles um yeah with only uh 35 seconds on the clock i think uh conclusion is that there are so many ways to do things from what i uh, from what i gather here um it's interesting that we have two people who are in completely different directions um and uh, yeah, I hope that that people, and especially the smaller developers who want to get started, can find their way into uh, into the industry some way or another. And with that, I want to thank you both for uh, chatting with me. And uh, yeah, I thank hope you. everything is going well and and will be going well in the future. I'm glad we avoided the COVID situation. So yeah, and that's about it. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Bye bye. <laughs>